All right, good morning, everybody. It, today is uh, not a thermodynamics lecture by me. We have a guest lecture by Professor Greg Olson. And we just finished a lot of work with thermocalc and CalFAT in general and solution modeling and binary phase diagrams. And, and I've told you throughout the entire semester that thermodynamic data is valuable and allows you to make, make predictions. That's why it's valuable. And those predictions allow you to make real things in the real world possible. And um, so far, you've just had to take my word for it. <laughs> so, so the point of today's guest lecture is that, um, so that you can not have to take my word for it anymore. So uh, I won't, I'll just say that Professor Olson is world famous for using thermodynamic data um, to, for real world impact. And I leave it at that. Is that okay, Greg? That's sufficient, um, I think. Yes, okay. yes. All right. Let, so, let's hope it's positive impact. Yes, okay, <laughs> yes, very good. Indeed. Uh, so I'll hand it. I hand it over to you. All right. Let me attempt my screen share. All right. My presentation will be from the perspective of my university day job, as well as the activities of our computational materials design company, Questec, and their ongoing collaborations through the uh, Chicago-based uh, ChimeD Materials Design Center. Uh, as thermocalc professor of the practice, uh, my job description is to make MIT a global beacon of CalFAD technology into which we are recruiting you. And in, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in support of that, uh, we've actually had a range that uh, MIT would host uh, this year's international CalFAD conference, but unfortunately due to the pandemic, We've had to postpone it a couple of years, but I hope uh, you'll still be around to, to, to join us when that happens. Uh, and I would like you uh, throughout, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt, uh, just uh, unmute yourself and, and yell at me if you'd like to discuss anything. Uh, the context of this technology is the National Materials Genome Initiative. Uh, that's a presidential initiative announced by President Obama uh, a decade ago. Uh, intended as a decadal initiative, but in fact, a recent National Academy study has recommended that it continue for another decade. And the uh, overarching goal of this initiative is uh, to build out the databases and tools that would allow us to take what has been historically a 10 to 20 year materials development cycle and compress that by at least uh, 50%. The metaphor of the genome uh, is discussed in the National Academy study going back to 2004 uh, on this very subject of accelerating the technology transition of materials and processes. Uh, so it reviewed uh, the best that had been achieved at that time. And then looking forward, looked at the analogy of the Human Genome Initiative as possibly the greatest uh, engineering database in history that was created not just to support uh, the life sciences, but uh, really to support science-based <clears throat> medicine, an example of which is that mRNA vaccine we're all getting these days. Uh, so it's had a tremendous impact in allowing a more science-based approach uh, to medicine. So the concept of the materials genome from the start uh, as uh, called for in this 2004 study uh, was to build out an equally fundamental uh, database uh, with the idea that the human genome physically functions as a database that directs the assembly of the structures of life. Uh, what are the equally fundamental parameters that direct the assembly of the microstructure of materials? And could we use such a system to not just support material science, but to enable a new form of science-based materials engineering? So it really was the ultimate engineering application and the ability to put our scientific understanding uh, in a useful predictive form uh, that really was the whole central concept of this materials genome initiative. Uh, and the recommendation in 2004 uh, is exactly the structure uh, that was formed and, and then is continuing today. Now, there have been many academy studies uh, acknowledging the new opportunity of computational materials engineering. But one thing that was unique about the 2004 study <coughs> was the leading role of a global network of small businesses that uh, created and maintained this technology and made this possible. Uh, and so this was a list that was constructed at, in that report of what uh, had already been uh, 
made available at that time and, and demonstrated uh, successes of the technology. Uh, the principal mechanism by this, the way that the, the, this technology has moved into major corporations has been by acquisitions of various forms that have af affected about a third of the companies on this chart. So small business really did create this technology and, and, and lead the way. Historic milestone was a decade ago with the first flight of uh, Questex Ferrium S53 stainless landing gear steel. And this was the first stainless steel uh, to meet the mechanical performance requirements of aircraft landing gear, uh, <clears throat> which was driven uh, by the need to eliminate uh, toxic cadmium plating. So this was a green steel solving an environmental uh, issue, uh, but more significant, it represented the first fully computationally designed and flight qualified material to go all the way uh, to flight. And that was just uh, in December of uh, 2010. So that really uh, measures a, a high level of maturity of this technology, even before the national MGI uh, was created. And that is reinforced by this timeline. So there had been debate <clears throat> as to what uh, a materials genome could be. It's very clear the genome we have is in fact the CalFAD uh, database uh, system. Uh, whose origins go back to Kaufman and Cohen at MIT in the 1950s uh, with a calculation of the iron nickel uh, phase diagram. Um, I'd like to emphasize though, the, the, the CalFAD acronym uh, is based on calculation of phase diagrams, but uh, the reason for that acronym <clears throat> was to distinguish it from something called FACOMP at the time uh, that was a technique that was trying to estimate uh, solubility limits in alloys from the attributes of a single phase. And CalFAD acknowledges that solubility is really uh, based on phase competition that is uh, represented by phase diagrams uh, in the equilibrium uh, limit. Uh, but in fact, uh, I hey, think, hey, yes. Before you can, can, if you don't mind, um, yeah. can you just briefly, uh, tell us about landing gear and why that's such an accomplishment. You know, I think we take a lot of these things for granted. You know, what, what is it like if there's one, one of many material criteria, for instance, that, that makes that such a demanding application so we can understand why that's such a big deal? Yeah, I think I'll come back to it a bit later, but it, but it is that the big challenge is that the high chromium levels that you need uh, to get the corrosion resistance are in conflict with the things you need for the mechanical performance of strength and fracture toughness. And it was a matter of uh, using a predictive science approach uh, to take it to a higher level of optimization that could uh, resolve that conflict uh, that wasn't going to happen by <laughs> empirical development. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate uh, uh, what was key to that uh, uh, later on. Yeah. But I wanna emphasize that uh, uh, actually is the name of your class uh, materials at equilibrium still, is that the name that's used? No, it's thermodynamics, but it, it might as well be materials at equilibrium. <laughs> okay, all right. Because, uh, you know, we tend to think of, uh, I think the way thermodynamics is taught often, we tend to think of it as something that applies only to equilibrium. But, but the truth is it wouldn't be called thermodynamics if it was only about equilibrium. It was created to describe heat engines that are highly dynamic systems, where in modeling them, it was useful to look at equilibrium limits. It's also very useful if you wanna measure thermodynamics, we should take systems to equilibrium so we know what we're measuring. But really the power of, of uh, thermodynamics is it describes the driving force of dynamic systems and it really drives the evolution of microstructures and processing and, and service. So uh, it really is, in that sense, the genomic data that drives the systems. <coughs> so in fact, uh, I prefer to uh, uh, describe CalFAD as calculated phase dynamics. And so it starts with thermodynamics, uh, but its real power is systems far from equilibrium. And in fact, uh, when it was invented by Kaufman and Cohen, uh, what they were really trying to do was not uh, to calculate a phase diagram. They were trying to take the information that's there in an equilibrium diagram and reduce it to its underlying thermodynamics so they could apply that thermodynamics to Martensitic transformations that are far from equilibrium. So it was really to create 
the get the underlying thermodynamics uh, to understand the driving forces for the dynamics of martensitic transformations. So it really is the non-equilibrium applications that drove the creation of the technology in the first place. So it began uh, as solution thermodynamics uh, and uh, became an international organization in the 1970s. Uh, and the first commercial software showed up around the 1980s. Uh, but then it expanded from solution thermodynamics to adding mobility databases and solving multi-component diffusion problems, moving on to other phase level attributes such as elastic uh, constants. Uh, so an increasing array of phase level uh, thermodynamic uh, and kinetic attributes uh, over an expanding scope of materials from metals to ceramics and very recently organic uh, systems as well. Uh, all of which was largely based on empirical measurement, uh, but today uh, DFT uh, physics calculations have received enough uh, accuracy and efficiency that they now actually actively participate and we integrate into the assessment of these databases uh, the uh, predictions uh, from uh, physics calculations, at least for zero Kelvin enthalpy uh, predictions. Uh, so it was the uh, arrival of the thermocalc system as a commercial code uh, and a supporting uh, software uh, database structure uh, set by the European SGTE consortium that set some level of standardization uh, that really inspired our founding in 1985 of our SRG uh, design consortium. And this was founded uh, at MIT. Uh, and the idea was uh, to create a general methodology of computational materials design that would be enabled by these underlying CALFAD uh, databases uh, with the idea that we would use high performance steels as the first example, acknowledging that we studied steels the longest, have the deepest predictive science foundation in steel, and also uh, at, at that point, the, the highest quality of uh, thermodynamic uh, data was available uh, for steels to use that as the demonstrator. So our first projects uh, were designs of steels, but uh, throughout the 1990s, uh, we did uh, a number of demo projects that applied the same methodology to other alloy systems, polymers, ceramics, and even uh, some composites to show its uh, generality. And it was the first steel designs that ultimately led to the founding in the late 1990s uh, of Questec uh, as a company that could offer uh, computational design services uh, uh, based on this technology. But what the Califed is really allowing us to do is, is use this mechanistic understanding we already possess, but use it in a quantitative system specific way. Uh, and that's what enabled the, the successful demonstrations of design of new materials uh, throughout the 1990s. Uh, and it was largely that demonstrated success that made the case uh, for the DARPA AIM initiative, which began at the start of the, the, the new millennium. Uh, and this was really addressing uh, the central uh, focus of what is now the MGI and what we now call Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, or ICME. And this was to go beyond the design of an alloy and spe uh, set a specification of composition and process uh, temperatures uh, to really address the full materials development cycle. Uh, and this meant uh, connecting materials models to macroscopic process models uh, to handle uh, material production scale up, uh, process optimization at the component level of things like landing gear. Uh, and then uh, most important, uh, the forecast of manufacturing variation so that you could predict the minimum properties of a material that uh, a user could count on at a 1% uh, probability uh, basis. And that's what it takes uh, to get a material actually uh, flight qualified for critical uh, applications. So at this point, uh, we've had over six decades of building out a materials genome with CALFAD structure, uh, about 30 years now of uh, uh, a, a full uh, design technology, and we've now been at uh, 20 years of a fully integrated uh, process. So it's quite uh, uh, developed. And as I'll touch on later on, uh, what this has allowed, the compression of the materials development cycle uh, getting it down to the cycle of product development has allowed for the first time uh, to uh, include materials in, in concurrent engineering. 
Historically, concurrent engineering meant everything but materials. You had to use whatever materials were available. Uh, and now there are a number of success stories I'll touch on later where materials have been fully integrated in concurrency and, and uh, allowing uh, a very strong synergy between materials development and product development. So that's the landscape. Core of our approach uh, is the philosophy of the late great Cyril Stanley Smith of MIT, uh, who uh, looked at the general principles of dynamic, interactive, multi-level structure or structure hierarchy, uh, and acknowledged an intrinsic complexity of material structure uh, for which he advocated that we should be taking a systems approach and essentially using the same framework of systems engineering uh, that the rest of engineering is already using. Uh, so we've taken that to heart. Uh, and to implement it, uh, another important contribution from the late great Morris Cohen of MIT is what he described as a reciprocity between the opposite philosophies of science and engineering that are represented by this unique linear structure in which the predictive cause and effect logic of science flows from left to right and the inductive goals means uh, logic of engineering flows from right to left. So it actually allows us to bring these two philosophies together in an, a, a streamlined non-turbulent way. So the uh, scientific prediction is that uh, However, we process the material will determine its structure, the structure will determine the properties and the combination of properties will determine its uh, performance. Uh, and this then enables a design system where we can set performance goals for a new material that we map to a set of property objectives, uh, use our knowledge of structure property relations to devise possible microstructures that are accessible through prescribed uh, processing. It's important to know that uh, the flow from left to right is unique. That exactly how we process will determine that structure and a unique set of properties and performance. Uh, it's always the nature of this inverse problem that we do not have uniqueness. That uh, once we have a set of property objectives, there are multiple structures and multiple process pathways uh, that we could use to, to achieve. Uh, so the approach uh, in, in uh, adopting a system framework is to use this as the backbone of a system structure and add Smith's structural hierarchy to it. So that each design project starts with a system chart. Uh, and the idea here uh, is to get the entire material down on a page. Uh, so the, the left to right flow of this is the cause and effect logic, but the process of design uh, works uh, from, from right to left uh, where performance uh, goals overall will be mapped to a quantitative set of properties such as strength, toughness for a high performance steel uh, and resistance to environmental hydrogen embrittlement. And from our mechanistic knowledge, we know that those properties map back to different subsystems in the hierarchy of microstructural subsystems, which we know dynamically evolve throughout the stages of materials uh, processing. And that allows us to then identify and prioritize the key structure property links and process structure links for which we wanna build out our uh, design models. Uh, now that can be done by uh, empirical correlations that are useful for interpolation, uh, but we really, uh, from the start, we're committed to, uh, by getting the most value out of the CALFAD fundamental data is to use uh, predictive science based on mechanistic understanding. And to express that mechanistic under a form that we could parameterize to make uh, devise parameters accessible uh, to those fundamental databases uh, to make uh, a, a quantitative approach to the full design uh, of the material that produces different levels of microstructure throughout different stages of processing uh, and meets all those uh, uh, property requirements for a useful material. And what that motivated uh, was the models uh, summarized here, which really is a, a subset of what's available in computational material science that, that allowed us to do uh, quantitative engineering. Uh, so at the bottom uh, level, uh, the, the three fields we uh, integrated were the DFT physics that was particularly useful for surface thermodynamics, which is more difficult to measure than bulk uh, thermodynamics. 
And of course, uh, the material science is, is uh, particularly advanced in the theory of uh, solid state precipitation and precipitation strengthening. Uh, and for structure property relations, uh, we applied, uh, brought in the micromechanical applications of continuum mechanics uh, to simulate unit processes of uh, fracture and fatigue uh, to set uh, the, the structure property relations. So these are really uh, the three disciplines that were integrated in this approach uh, for, to meet performance goals. But equally important is to constrain the processability of a material. And that's a role for the CalFAD based material science models of the solid solid phase transformations and the liquid solid phase transformations. Uh, both of we, which are uh, scale dependent uh, in terms of the size of heat treated components uh, through the size dependence of heat transfer. Uh, so ultimately it's the linking of, of these microstructural models to the macroscopic process uh, simulations uh, that allow us to constrain materials up front theoretically to be processable on a design uh, on a desired scale. Uh, and that really uh, helps to accelerate the full cycle uh, instead of experimental uh, scale up. Uh, so what's uh, represented here on the right are the software models and their, uh, their, their uh, platforms. Uh, and the advanced instrumentation is equally important. The ability to use techniques uh, such as the atom probe to actually measure the complex compositions of uh, nanoscale uh, strengthening precipitates in our ultra high strength uh, materials. So from the start, uh, uh, calibration and validation to understand the associated uncertainty of our predictions was, was really important. Uh, and that's what the instrumentation was uh, enabling. So our first example, uh, starting out in the 1980s to design ultra high strength uh, steels, uh, we first took apart the highest performance steel of the time, which was the AF 1410 steel, uh, which is tempered at 510C to precipitate uh, alloy M2C carbide. So these are HCP carbides, where the M is a combination of chromium, molybdenum, and vanadium, and sometimes tungsten. Uh, so we brought together a wide array of uh, techniques to map the time evolution of the precipitate uh, particle size, uh, the uh, aspect ratio of the carbides, their number density, total volume fraction, uh, and their, uh, uh, the evolution of the carbide lattice parameters and associated composition uh, trajectory. And then this summarizes the evolution of the precipitation uh, strengthening. Uh, the evolution of the size uh, was consistent with the theory of precipitation at high supersaturations. And in that regime, uh, we can treat the initial critical nucleus size uh, as the fundamental scaling factor for particle size that's so important to strengthening. Uh, and that of course scales inversely with the precipitation driving force. So this is a way we could uh, get a thermodynamic handle on the particle size that governs uh, strengthening uh, efficiency in these systems. But it was important to recognize <clears throat> that the uh, trajectory of the lattice parameters uh, driven by the composition trajectory of the carbides is consistent with the initial nucleation being in a fully coherent state. So it was necessary to add to the CalFAD chemical thermodynamics an elastic energy term uh, that's composition dependent through the composition dependence of the lattice parameters uh, setting the misfit strains. So all that was put together uh, to get uh, uh, precise uh, driving forces for the precipitation of these carbides so we could efficiently control the particle uh, size. And uh, what that leads to then uh, is this simplified parametric approach to, to strengthening, where from the Orowan uh, strengthening theory, uh, the precipitation strengthening scales inversely with the spacing uh, of the obstacles. Uh, and that spacing uh, scales with particle size over phase fraction to the one half uh, for the uh, spacing uh, in a slip plane. Uh, and that means then uh, the precipitation strengthening goes as F to the one half over particle size. And if we accept this uh, scaling uh, to the initial critical nucleus size that scales inversely to the driving force, uh, then we can write that the precipitation strengthening will scale directly with that thermodynamic driving force times phase fraction to the one half. Uh, 
so this predicted that uh, we ought to be able to design steels uh, with higher driving forces to get more efficient uh, strengthening. And that was then tested by making uh, a series of steels that had a uh, uh, fixed carbon content setting uh, the ultimate phase fraction of the precipitates. Uh, and then we used our coherent thermodynamics to predict the driving force. Uh, but as well, uh, uh, by the time we get to the temperatures where we can have sub substitutional diffusion, uh, the uh, carbon diffusion controlled formation of iron carbides like Fe3C will already have occurred and that lowers the chemical potential of the carbon. So it was necessary to get these driving forces right. Uh, we had to first consider a constrained equilibrium with Fe3C uh, to set the carbon potential. Uh, and then we were able to validate that uh, with the, uh, within the scatter of these measurements, uh, the, at, at a fixed carbon level, we could vary uh, the, the hardness, the peak hardness of this uh, strengthened steel over about 20 uh, points on a Rockville C scale. So very dramatic uh, direct uh, proportionality pr predicted by the model. And so that calibration became the, the principal tool that we used to design steels with much more efficient strengthening, uh, demonstrating alloys that for a given carbon content could have 50% more strength uh, than, than the previous technology. So it's an area that's been uh, highly developed empirically uh, but in fact, uh, there was a lot more to be achieved by being more predictive and taking systems to a high level uh, of optimization uh, using these tools. Now, what I wanted to uh, just touch on is uh, there's also an important role of the surface thermodynamics. And uh, uh, this is a case where we made very good use of the DFT predictions. Uh, but what this chart is about is a correlation of the embrittlement potency of interfacial segregants uh, against the uh, segregation energy difference between free surfaces and grain boundaries. Uh, and in this case, uh, there is experimental data to, to validate this, but this is actually the case of uh, predicting it with our DFT quantum mechanics with, with pretty good uh, accuracy. Uh, so these are the well-known interstitial components that have been well uh, studied. Substitutional elements were less well studied. Uh, so after demonstrating the ability to compute these uh, numbers, we actually built out this database of the embrittlement potency from surface thermodynamics, uh, which was calibrated and validated by some large scale uh, DFT calculations. Uh, giving us these predictions from which we were able to identify the strong cohesion enhancers uh, that could uh, sufficiently enhance grain boundary cohesion to offset the embrittling effect of hydrogen. And this allowed us to design these very high performance steels to, to no longer uh, be prone to the intergranular form of stress corrosion uh, cracking. So it was a big advance in the uh, resistance to hydrogen embrittlement in this class of steels. So it's Great. one example, yeah. Hey, one second. Can, can you um, fill in what is DFT? Uh, a couple times at this yes. point. We talk okay. about data a lot. So where does that data come from? Yeah, so that density functional theory. So, so this is uh, something that uh, we basically have ways to solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but there is a menu of approximations that you do take along the way. Uh, but it really is essentially first principles prediction of uh, energy at, at zero Kelvin. Right. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So, so we, we, we use a lot of empirical data in O2O, but you've also probably used um, DFT derived data, even without knowing it. So when you have some materials property data, it comes from somewhere and sometimes it comes from theory and sometimes it comes from measurement. And um, uh, oftentimes if it comes from theory, it comes from DFT calculation. Yeah, it, it is. And, and uh, in this, there are different approximations and this was an all electron method, very rigorous, but it was typically something like uh, 400 hours of Cray supercomputer time for each data point back in the 1980s when we did uh, Asked a question, which do you prefer? I think you mean, which do I prefer experiment or theory? Um, is that what you meant? Here, speak, speak of it. If you unmute yourself, it's, it's more fun. Yeah, uh, I mean like for, the applications like of prediction, uh, which is better to extrapolate. Uh. So Greg, if you had your choice, be, I mean, uh, I'll just say, first of all, it's often not, it's often an apples to oranges comparison. 
because we use DFT most often to get data for processes or situations that we just can't measure. Yeah. Which I think gives you your answer. If you have yeah. apples to apples, if you have a measurement and a calculation of the same thing in the same circumstance, I think Greg and I would, would agree. We, we, if the measurement's a good one, um, we go with that. Yeah, if you look at the magnitude of this, uh, you know, we're, we're using this method to find uh, the ones that have this cohesion enhancing potency of greater than one EV. And the intrinsic uncertainty of even these calculations is about 0.1 EV. And this other model got it within 0.2 EV. So uh, it is important to understand the uncertainty uh, of those predictions. So if it's plus or minus 0.1 EV, that's fine for helping you find the one EV candidates. But most often in metallurgy, the number we want to know is only of the magnitude 0.1. And 0.1 plus or minus 0.1 is not very useful. Uh, so it's a good way to, to find out where to go for the big numbers. But most of the time, uh, we really need the experimental data that gives us higher accuracy than we can get currently from the DFT methods. So that's why I was saying that uh, upfront uncertainty quantification was a very important part of the whole strategy of putting these tools together. Okay, but this is a good example of maximum use of DFT. We had a small set of experimental surface thermodynamics to test against, uh, and then we could calibrate against the ability of DFT to predict it, uh, and then make this projection across the periodic table. So it's a, a surface thermodynamic genome uh, almost entirely from DFT calculations. And the way we put it all together is graphical parametric design. So we, we map the behaviors of interest back to these parameters like driving force and phase fraction for strengthening. And so for the actual stainless uh, landing gear steel, uh, here's a cross plot versus uh, molybdenum content affecting the driving force and the carbon affecting the phase fraction. And there are a couple invisible yellow contours, uh, uh, contours showing how the driving force increases with molybdenum. And of course the carbon sets the phase fraction. So it's this region in here uh, that gave us the strength level uh, that is our goal for the design. And superimposed on that are processability constraints such as the martensite start temperature to have a fully martensitic steel and the solution temperature to put the uh, reactive components in solution so we can precipitate them uh, at, at high temperatures. Uh, and the relative slopes that we can see from these types of plots also allow us to assess relative sensitivities so we can develop robust uh, design strategies that, that, are, that don't require too tight a tolerance. Uh, so quite typically, we, we start from the last stage of processing, the, the nanoscale precipitation that meets the strength goals, and then back up to earlier stages of processing where we're also using uh, these uh, FCC, MC uh, type carbides. In this case, we've got uh, uh, a composition variable and the process temperature. So we're constraining these grain refining particles to be soluble at homogenization temperatures, able to precipitate out at forging temperatures, and then maintain a certain phase fraction and size at the final austenitizing temperature of the steel uh, that sets the grain size of the steel. So similarly, we can back up to even earlier stages of processing, specify the deoxidation processes that set the primary inclusions at the multi-micron level that are important to uh, toughness and, and fatigue resistance. Uh, but that graphical strategy uh, is uh, very uh, efficient uh, and it is the practice that we use uh, at Questec and the practice that I teach in my design class. So the first four products uh, to come out of that are, are these high performance secondary hardening steels. Uh, we have now two uh, flight qualified steels as, as well as the stainless that's uh, used by the Air Force. Uh, we have a high toughness steel uh, that's first gone into the hook shank application for the carrier based uh, planes. Uh, so both of those steels are flying. Uh, we also have very high performance carburizing steels for gear, gear steels for fatigue resistance, and that's doing well uh, on off-road and on-track racing. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Red Bull uh, Formula One team that's very competitive uh, this year is actually using our gear steels uh, for, uh, for their reliability. Uh, and those gear steels now are being qualified for uh, helicopter applications. Uh, but all of these benefit uh, from that extra uh, strengthening efficiency that we get 
by refining those M2C carbides down to a three nanometer uh, size scale through that uh, maximization of driving force uh, as validated here by an early 3D uh, atom probe reconstruction. So all four of those steels are using greater strengthening efficiency to resolve the conflict between with other properties. Greg, uh, this is the, maybe the second or more time you've mentioned Adam Pro, and there's a data set right in the middle here. So it seems like a good opportunity to talk about what that is. Yes, the uh, Adam Probe is a, a version of the field ion uh, microscope uh, that, that looks at the point of a very sharp pin to get very high electric fields. Uh, and uh, it can actually uh, cause uh, evaporation uh, from the high fields. Uh, and so we can evaporate uh, atoms off of the tip and project them to a position sensitive detector and actually reconstruct the position of the atoms in the tip. So it really is uh, uh, taking us down to nanoscale uh, spatial resolution uh, with detectability of, of uh, all atoms in, in the periodic table. So a very powerful technique. If I may, it pulls apart a material atom by atom and tells you where all the atoms were. Yep. <laughs> That's what it does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we have very good facility at Northwestern, but there's also a very good one uh, at, uh, at Harvard that we're, we're using now. Oh, uh, can you use the material after that? Like, does it change the surface? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is true tomography. So we're fully, we are really toming the material and taking it apart. Uh, but one thing we can do uh, is before we do the tomography, we can look at the tip uh, in the electron microscope. So we can get uh, diffraction information, crystallographic data, uh, fully characterize the tip in TEM before we then take it apart in the atom probe. But it does, uh, it's like you're getting beamed up, but you're never getting beamed back down. That's it right. It tears the material apart atom by atom and, and does not put it back together again. Right. It, well, it puts it back together theoretically, right? Theoretically. <laughs> yeah, so we reassemble it uh, as tomography, yep. All right. Yeah, I would uh, just touch on the, the DARPA AIM initiative. Again, this, this uh, full compression of the cycle is this linking uh, to macroscopic process models. And so we were able to work with uh, GE and Pratt and & Whitney and and learn about the technology of multidisciplinary computational engineering. So this integrator was linked to all the, to the tools of macroscopic uh, aero turbine engine design, uh, including heat transfer for he, uh, heat treatment. So we built this precipicalc uh, simulator. So this uh, puts together the CalFAD thermo and mobility databases and adds some surface thermodynamic quantities uh, to actually simulate uh, complex nucleation and growth uh, in complex alloys uh, so that we could actually predict the uh, effects of very complex heat treatments of uh, turbine disks that had multimodal distributions of gamma prime precipitates uh, and very accurately control it and use it to demonstrate it in process optimization, uh, validating a predicted uh, overspin burst speed of a, of a uh, turbine disk. And then ultimately we did develop strategies uh, to predict the cumulative probability distribution of properties uh, from the variation that can occur uh, for, during manufacturing from the allowed tolerances of the specifications of material composition and processing. And we were able to get information that normally would uh, take a lot of time and money uh, and a lot of testing like uh, 300 turbine disks before you'd have enough uh, data. And we could, uh, with only uh, 15 data points and mechanistic models, actually predict this 1% uh, minimum property at room temperature and elevated temperature. So we demonstrated the strategy to, to get the qualification data of necessary minimum properties very efficiently by predictive modeling based on these CalFed tools. Uh, and so here's the time uh, chart on the ter two uh, landing gear steels. So this is the technology readiness levels uh, at the level of the landing gear. Here's the corresponding materials uh, uh, milestones. And so both of these steels went from a clean sheet of paper to flight <clears throat> in less than a decade, uh, meeting uh, the MGI goals. Uh, but it, particularly doing it the second time, we were able to move more quickly uh, into the Navy, trusting our predictions well enough to, to give us the technology for the hook shank application. So, 
we actually had uh, component qualification within a month of material qualification in that case. And this has been a case study uh, for the MGI program uh, where uh, it was reviewed in the second landing gear steel. What were the technology accelerators using this technology and what were the inhibitors uh, doing it in a small business where we were, uh, there were lapses in the federal funding of the projects and there was a reliance on toll manufacturing by others. It was estimated that we had really developed, uh, demonstrated a technology capable of a three year cycle. And that, that's really the important key of, that's what enables concurrency. Uh, and really the uh, most historic example of that so far uh, was the Apple Watch announced in 2014. Uh, so these are all new alloys developed by Apple uh, that were uh, designed and developed concurrently uh, with the development of this device and, and actually uh, uh, delivered in less than two years uh, from their acquiring the technology from Quest Tech to actually do this. And that included uh, the high strength anodizable aluminum alloy that ultimately uh, went into the 6S iPhone. So uh, uh, it's been estimated there's now a 50% chance that you've got a computationally designed material in your pocket. Uh, and it came from this CalFAD based uh, technology. Uh, from there, uh, news travels fast in the valley and it caught the attention of this guy. Uh, I actually had the opportunity, uh, he invited me out to give him a half hour elevator pitch. Uh, I thought I was uh, selling him our technology. Turns out I was selling him Charlie Cuman, my uh, former student who was the founding uh, president of CEO uh, who had gone to Apple. And so after three years at Apple, he, he moved uh, uh, to be vice president of materials technology at both SpaceX uh, and Tesla. So this technology has been taken uh, even further uh, in that in that environment, uh, and uh, notably included <coughs> a burn resistant nickel super alloy uh, that allows the high oxygen pressures that uh, really enables the Raptor engine of the Mars Starship. So, so it gives you a rare example of a corporate uh, CEO bragging about uh, his metallurgists. Uh, I think what I'll do is I just want to mention. Uh, the back here on planet Earth, we've got uh, this CHIMED Center as a decadal uh, center supporting the MGI. Uh, it's in its second five years of, a, of, a, of its 10 years. It's uh, largely based in Chicago, but MIT is a partner to it. Uh, and it's looking at not only uh, improving these methodologies, but greatly expanding their scope, notably inclu including taking this to organic systems and, and polymers as well. And they're building out essentially a polymer CalFAD uh, to design all materials uh, by the same uh, methodology. Uh, and I'll just mention that uh, a lot of the current projects are looking specifically at the design of materials uh, for the new technology of additive uh, manufacturing. Uh, and here's a, some of the early projects at Questec in that field. And one of our more important designs was a high temperature aluminum that uses unique features of uh, additive manufacturing that compared to this uh, scandium bearing alloy, we have scandium free alloys using some rare earth elements uh, that are able to sustain high strength in aluminum alloy out to very uh, high temperatures, very promising. And it's a unique microstructure that can only be achieved by uh, uh, additive manufacturing. Um, did want to mention, uh, Electro ceramic, we had the opportunity under this DARPA simplex program. We were asked by DARPA to look at integrating new uh, data mining techniques with our CalFAD based design strategy and apply it specifically to thermoelectric systems. Uh, so here, uh, this is the system chart uh, for a thermoelectric material where the basic conflict is we want electrical conductivity but not thermal conductivity. And the way to break that uh, is to use microstructure for phonon scattering uh, to get the thermal conductivity down. So it was a chance to use the same kind of hierarchical uh, microstructures that we use in structural alloys of precipitation and uh, grain refinement uh, to manage uh, the thermal conductivity. And one early example of that was to build out the CalFAD thermodynamics of this lead telluride, lead sulfide system, uh, taking the same framework. Uh, and then actually predict from a phonon scattering model, uh, 
uh, if we optimize the particle size, uh, what level of performance uh, we could achieve as we vary the phase fraction of the lead sulfide particles. And it showed that it agreed with the uh, data from empirical development in the literature at low phase fractions, but actually said at these higher phase fractions, uh, if we were to refine the particles to their optimum size, there is more performance that you could achieve from that system. So this is a very early uh, demo of applying CALFAD to these systems as well. Uh, and this is underway now uh, in, as part of the CHIMAD Center, Jeff Snyder at Northwestern is actively developing uh, the use of the CALFAD tools uh, to control, predictably control microstructure optimization in, in these same uh, systems. But of course, what you really wanna know is what about bubble gum? And so uh, we did get support uh, from Wrigley, uh, did have four years of support for a doctor of bubble gum. Uh, and we were asked to uh, uh, make uh, a four component, uh, easy to manufacture uh, gum, similar to uh, Hubba Bubba Seriously Strawberry, uh, could we, with that simple a formula, get the performance level of uh, Hubba Bubba Max, which is the highest performance commercial bubble gum, but very difficult to manufacture. And we did succeed uh, with our modeling to uh, even outperform uh, the highest performance uh, gum out there. So we had finally had produced a material that uh, society could appreciate. It was very uh, rewarding. And uh, this was aided by a student team that actually won the ASM design competition back in uh, 2008. And if you'd like to learn more about that, I suggest you sign up uh, next year for uh, 3041 and learn how to be a materials designer. Here's an example of the five projects uh, currently underway. Uh, all of these connect back to the CHIMAD uh, research. Uh, so uh, the teams identified in red here are all being coached by uh, doctoral students and postdocs uh, whose thesis is on that particular design project to help student teams uh, uh, get to the high technical level it uh, takes to actually do the computational design of a complete material with some challenging objectives, uh, notably including a project this year that uh, where Apple is the uh, client. Uh, and we've had a number of students uh, uh, coming out of the class who have gone to take uh, internships over the summer at Apple. They're very uh, pleased with the students. So I highly recommend you sign up and join us next year. All right. Well, that was fantastic. That covered a lot of ground, Greg, and, and we're right on time. So uh, I hope it wasn't too dizzying, but of course you have the opportunity to go back and play it over and slow me down. <laughs> it, it was dizzying, but it was a really impressive show of impact, so thank you. We have, um, so as usual, I, I'm going to uh, stop recording in a minute, but I'm very happy to take questions or I'm sure Greg is happy to take questions for a couple minutes. Indeed. At least till the bottom of the hour. Um, you know, uh, questions about CalFAD, the mechanism, the history, the, the science, landing gear, Elon Musk, and the above, I'm sure. Did you, did you know how important this was to your, to your well, to your, your modern lives? <laughs> Even in your iPhone. <laughs> and uh, it will help reduce, it will help reduce the price of your Mars ticket too, for the efficiency of the engine. Yeah. Well, the models uh, that worked with like the heat, uh, that worked with the heat transfer from other uh, companies. I think you said we're working with uh, I just met Air Force or Dapper that uh, you collaborated with uh, other engineering yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, companies. The, right. So, so, so the idea of ICME is to link the materials models to the macroscopic processing tools, where yeah. very often it's all about the heat transfer. So we were uh, in the AIM project, we were able to then uh, simulate the heat transfer, the, the, the actual thermal processing of a turbine disk. Uh, and then take the thermal history at different nodes uh, in that simulation uh, and simulate its full evolution of its complex microstructure uh, through uh, that complex uh, processing uh, and actually predict the spatial variation uh, in the turbine disk of uh, structure and properties uh, with an accuracy within one KSI in the yield strength. Uh, what's the models employed by Intellect? Uh, mechanic like this mechanical engineering uh, 
uh, like, com like compatible with the materials uh, models in terms of like the math or continuity or that stuff? Yeah, well, that, that's the role of that uh, eyesight uh, process integration and design optimization software. So there are integration tools like that that are intended to connect models from any software on any platform and be able to transfer the output of one to, as the input uh, to another. Uh, right. and, I'll, and I'll say this is um, this sort of integration is um, is part of what you're doing on this. I'm not not piece at um, seven, but um, piece at eight, which is you know you, you have software and it has data and it outputs some form of data, and you want to model that so that you could perhaps use it in a different piece of software, you know, and and. Um, you know, you're doing this uh, today, you know, you, you're doing this O2O in a sense of very low level down in the weeds, looking at, you know, a couple of traces of data. But, you know, once you understand the sort of things that happen down in the weeds, you can start to step back and look at a bigger picture and imagine more sophisticated integration. So it's, it's, it's great that you brought that up. Yeah, and of course that, that is all a very important part of this concurrent engineering approach that we can actually link the computational tools across disciplines and uh, simulate the system level. So I guess going, going off of that, you mentioned a few times how now with all the new technologies and methods of sort of understanding how materials work, how now there's a lot more concurrent engineering taking place, sort of how the materials are being developed alongside the, the products that are going out to market or for consumers to use. And I was wondering how tied those two things are. Like if, if you know if the, there are like different teams working on different aspects of it or if it's really becoming more and more integrated in terms of like the production teams. Yeah, uh, I, I would say there, there is ever increasing integration. Uh, and of course, in the case of Apple, these really are consumer products that they're uh, and very novel products that they are developing on a very accelerated schedule. But uh, what they're very good at is the manufacturing engineer because they make stuff on such a huge scale. Uh, so they're very good at that. I think at SpaceX, you're seeing uh, very innovative technology. Uh, so the early ideation of uh, taking extremely challenging problems like how we get humans to Mars efficiently uh, is making maximum use of this. And, and uh, there, it's, it's a very thorough integration at all levels. Uh, so they use this, the so-called 80% solution that uh, uh, it's often said that uh, with, uh, with 20, in computation, with 20% of the resources, you can get 80% of the way where you're trying to go. And then the question is, do you really want to spend the next 80% to only get another 20%? Uh, so it pretty much at all levels of uh, structure, they'll take the computation to 80% for everything, including materials now. Uh, and then of course they blow up rockets at SpaceX and those are highly instrumented blowing up rockets. And that's the idea is to test at the full system level and approach full system level optimization, uh, taking everything to its limits instrumented so they can dial it back on, on the next one. Uh, but the, the pace at which they're able to do this is really incredible by integrating across all those disciplines. Mm 